people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say, that's the bad guy. That's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this per tweet from Michael Benson. Javante Davis versus Lamont Roach reportedly could take place December 21st, the same date as Usyk versus Fury 2, Tank versus Roach would be in Washington, D.C., USA, while Usyk versus Fury is set for Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Difference in location. Difference in price. We know that Turkey LL Sheik is working to lower the price point of his Riyadh season shows to make them that much more affordable to that many more people. We're talking about a price point of anywhere in between 15 to 20 dollars, whereas Javante Davis's fight will comparatively be more expensive. Maybe between 80 and 90. Tough sell. Initially, it was thought that Gervonta would be facing Rayo Valenzuela in his very next fight before the year is out, though apparently not. An offer was made to Rayo to do the fight before the year is out, but according to Robert Garcia, who trains Rayo, the offer was for 135 pounds. Rayo is champion at 140. They didn't go for it. I wondered about that. If they're making a play to fight Rayo Valenzuela, would it be for Rayo's title at 140 pounds or Gervonta's at 135? And if it's for Gervonta's at 135, does Rayo want to move back down? There's your answer. Perhaps Rayo will warm up to the idea of moving down to face Gervonta since Gervonta doesn't want to move up to face him. Perhaps he'll warm up to that idea when the fight is revisited at some point next year, but it doesn't look to be happening this one. This year, it looks like Gervonta's fighting Lamont Roach. Boxing insider Rick Glacier reacted to this news saying, there's so many negative comments about Gervonta Davis fighting Lamont Roach that I'm forwarding the post and all the comments to a PBC operative. Let's see if Al Heyman and other PBC executives listen to what all of the boxing enthusiasts have to say about Tank's opponent. Stay tuned. What do I think about Tank's opponent? What do I think about Lamont Roach? Well, Lamont might be a champion at 130 pounds, but that doesn't legitimize him at 135. You might be good at one weight, but not so good at another. Why is Gervonta Davis looking at another super featherweight? Why are you looking to super featherweights to fight for your lightweight title? Why? There's a lot wrong with this picture. The duration of time that Gervonta Davis has spent campaigning at lightweight and what is his lightweight resume so far remember that he first moved up there in 2019 so he's been up there roughly four or five years after that amount of time it should be a lot deeper he should have a lot more to show for it that you would have been in the same division as Vasil Lomachenko, Teofimo Lopez, George Cambosos, Devin Haney, now Shakur Stevenson having not faced any of them and you've been there for five years and no one you did face there compares to them roly romero isaac cruz frank martin the vast majority of boxing fans do not see these fighters through the same lens that they see those fighters they're not thought of as being as good because they're not and that's all he's really done at lightweight and he's been there for about five years i tend him with bringing up the likes of hector luis garcia from Super Featherweight, now you're bringing up Lamont Roach, also from Super Featherweight. What does he expect to buy this? It's not even that Lamont Roach is a bad fighter because he's not a bad fighter. He's formidable at Super Featherweight, but this is lightweight. He's done absolutely nothing to legitimize himself as a lightweight. And I don't anticipate that this fight will do any better at the box office than the Frank Martin fight just did. I think about as many people are familiar with Lamont Roach as they are familiar with Frank Martin. Now, the location of the match is pretty important, that these are two fighters from the DMV area. So on the ground and at the gate, it might do all right, which is usually the case with Gervonta Davis's fights. But the pay-per-view numbers, the pay-per-view buys, 
Pops is probably going to do whatever the Frank Martin fight did, which wasn't a lot. And that a more high profile fight with two more high profile fighters is happening that same day. Two pay-per-views going head to head with each other with a noticeable difference in price. That makes this show even harder to sell. Patience is wearing thin. Gervonta Davis has been campaigning at the same weight as Vasil Lomachenko, Teofimo Lopez, George Cambosos, Devin Haney, now Shakur Stevenson, and he has yet to face one of them that at least, at least, Teofimo and Devin and George can say that they fought Loma, Loma fought them. They fought each other. Well, didn't Gervonta Davis try to fight Vasil Lomachenko? He did, though it doesn't help that you waited. You waited up until Loma was courting retirement to reach out for a fight. Day late and a dollar short, buddy. Should have took care of that a long time ago. You've been there long enough. Long enough that Devin moved up and Teofimo Lopez moved up. Shakur Stevenson moved up to your division. Not that he's available right now because he isn't. The paying customer doesn't necessarily need all the backstory. They're either interested in buying your fight or they're not. Can provide the history lesson for context, but it's a lot more simple. They're either interested in buying your fight or they're not. And I anticipate they're not gonna be. Not for what it costs. No more interested than they were in the Frank Martin fight. Frank Martin as an opponent. No more people are going to be interested to see you fight Lamont Roach than they were interested to see you fight him. Bottom line. You could dress it up however you like. Explain it however you like. The boxing fan, the customer, doesn't need to understand why you arrived at this opponent. It all boils down to whether or not they want to see you fight this guy or not, and are they willing to pay. That's what it's all about. So here comes another overpriced pay-per-view. Men's super lightweight news. Another look at Devin Haney's recent comments that Teofimo Lopez rejected the opportunity to fight him as part of a Riyadh season show, saying, I was supposed to get back in the ring in October in Saudi, and the next fight was going to be Teo. Turkey offered him the fight, and he said he's not ready. Devin wins that fight. On the premise that what he's saying is true, and it's genuine, and an offer actually went out from Turkey to Teo to face Devin if they would have fought or if they end up fighting I like Devin Haney to win. I like Devin by way of a points decision. In spite of how he looked with Ryan Garcia, Teofimo Lopez is not Ryan Garcia. He's not built like Ryan Garcia. He doesn't have Ryan's height and length, even if he's got some speed, like Ryan has got some speed. Because he's a shorter, stumpier fighter than Ryan, because he's a shorter, stumpier fighter than Devin, the dichotomy of the fight is different. You're thinking back to the Ryan fight, the Ryan Garcia fight, and how Ryan was able to regularly land the left hook on Devin Haney as Devin was inching forward, throwing the jab, wasn't keeping that right hand high enough, so as he's stepping in, he's getting caught with left hooks. The Lopez fight would be different because Lopez ain't as tall as Ryan. It's not gonna be Devin coming to him, it's gonna be Lopez coming to Devin. He doesn't have the height or length to hang back and set up a counter left like Ryan set up the counter left, because if he hangs back, Devin can touch him comfortably with the jab. Devin's got more height and length than Tio, so if Tio hangs back with him, it's a different dynamic. That fight would be closer to the Regis Progre fight than the Ryan Garcia fight. The aesthetic of that fight would be closer to the Progre fight because both Regis Progre, Tio Fimo Lopez, are boxer punchers, counter punchers. Both use a shell guard, both pack a decent sized punch, and at their very best, they're hanging back, setting traps, and setting up counters. But if you do that with Devin, you do that with a pure boxer, he's going to pick you off. He's going to manage the distance with his lead hand, keep Tio at arm's length, try to, which will then force Tio to come forward. And we know that Tio coming forward is not the same Tio when he's hanging back. Coming forward, he's more vulnerable, more hittable. Like he was in a George Cambosos fight where he got dropped, like he was in a Sandor Martin fight where he got dropped two times, and like he was in the Jermaine Ortiz fight. Doesn't diversify his offense enough when he's taking the offensive, when he's the one coming forward. He's not as good at that. So much of what you're doing relies on landing a hard counter first. If you don't get the chance to land that hard counter, the other stuff doesn't come, the other punches. That's why Devin was able to beat a harder puncher than himself in Regis Progre. That's why I think he would beat Teofimo Lopez. Same deal, same dynamic, same shit.
T.O. might be a harder puncher than Devin Haney. He might be, but power, power means nothing if you can't land. What's interesting is that Ryan Garcia did land. He landed the left hook several times, and in spite of landing that left hook, he didn't knock Devin out. He didn't get him out of there. I don't think T.O. Fimo would get him out of there, and he'd struggle even more. He'd struggle to land hooks, to land much of anything. Devin would win a ho-hum decision and make T.O. Fimo look bad like Sandor Martin made T.O. Fimo look bad. Devin would fight a better version of the fight that Sendor fought. Tio is basic. Ordinary. I don't care if you like him. I don't care if you like him in small doses. I don't care if you're a bigot like he's a bigot. I think you guys often confuse analyzing a fight and what's likelier to happen than not than who your favorite fighter is. I don't care who your favorite fighter is or why. Tio just had a guy he didn't have to chase, he didn't have to find standing in front of him all night and Steve Claggett, and he didn't get Steve Claggett out of there. Nope. Guy who's coming forward, standing in front of him. So a guy who's moving away? Forget it. By now we already know that T.O. struggles with movement. If you don't, then you don't know shit about boxing, and you need to shut up. Be quiet, and stop expecting me as a content creator to pull punches on your favorite fighters. I don't care who your favorite fighters are. Watch another goddamn channel if it bothers you so much. If they fight, I've got Devin winning a points decision. He'd beat basic female Lopez. And just by the way, uh, before this fight with Tyler Denny was made, the offer was made uh, to uh, Janibek Al McAnuli, who is the unified IBF and WBO champion, to defend the title against Shiraz on this card. They offered him well over a million dollars. They turned it down. And now uh, Janibek is on his way to Australia uh, to fight for like, uh, you know, 200 grand or something like that. Uh, against uh, Mikhailovich. So that was none of a bad mistake on their part. Well, what do we say all the time about the business of boxing? Sometimes if they are offering you the money, take the money exactly. on that. Show me the money like Jerry Maguire in the 90s in that movie with Tom Cruise. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you're being uh, that, ooh, that's a bit surprising that it was that kind of offer and he didn't take the fight. So we can add the name of veteran boxing scribe Dan Raphael to the list of boxing scribes saying that Yanni Beck rejected an offer to fight Hamza, Hamza Shiraz later today. Kevin Ioli, Jake Donovan, now Dan Raphael are all saying the same thing. And I don't see why they would make something like that up. So one thing that caught my attention about Yanni Beck's current predicament that he now has to travel to Australia to fight Andre to defend his title or titles because top rank lost the purse bid. It's the amount of money they lost it by. Only a thousand dollars, just a thousand dollars for what is a blind bid. It's almost like the people at No Limit were tipped off as to what top rank's bid was going to be and they bid just enough to beat them. Initially, I wondered, did somebody at the IBF tip off No Limit Promotions? Now I'm starting to wonder if Top Rank tipped them off themselves. Why would they do that? Yanni Beck Alamkanalai caught wind of Dan Raphael's comments and said, Dan Raphael, joke of the year. If you said it, you must prove it. If you think that rumors are information, no one sent me a contract. Climus Boxing, did we have a contract? Guys, everyone says that I refused the big fight and refused to fight with Hamza. Are you kidding? Send me the contract now. I will sign it now. I will fight anyone, anywhere. Or does the boxing world only believe rumors? I'm here and I'm saying this. And my manager, Aegis, also wrote that this is not true. How can they say we refuse to fight? Go back. Why would you think Top Rank themselves tipped off No Limit as to what they were going to bid? Why would they willfully lose the purse bid? Because they don't want to have to pay for this guy anymore. They don't want to have to pay for his fights. They're not getting anything out of promoting Yanni Bek Alam Kanalai. Then why did they bid at all? Optics. They have to put something up. They have to try to at least make it seem like they put an effort into trying to win the rights for his fight. But behind the scenes, they might have caught No Limit up themselves told them what they were going to bid, told them, listen, if you want to promote this thing and you want to give your guy a better shot at beating Yanni Beck, we're bidding $350,000 tomorrow. All you've got to do is bid a little bit over that and you get the rights to this fight. They might have told him. You're thinking to yourself, how does top rank benefit from outsourcing their champion, their middleweight champion? Well, they're not on the hook to pay for his fight, so that's $350,000 they don't have to spend. That's one. And they still get their cut. They still get their cut off the top of his purse, their 10% or whatever it is. That's two. What's three? 
the situation with the WBO title. How initially it was reported that both titles won't be on the line. Why wouldn't the WBO title be on the line? To want to focus on is, if it's not two alphabet titles on the line, if it's just the one, the IBF title, that means Yanni Beck is subject to a 10 pound rehydration cap. For a fighter who just collapsed due to dehydration earlier this year, surely you can see why you would want both titles to be on the line so you have that wiggle room to rehydrate to wherever you want to rehydrate to. But initially, it was reported that only the IBF title would be on the line. Nobody explained why. Igis Klimas pushed against that. Igis, who manages the career of Yanni Bek Alamkanalai, he asserted that both titles would be on the line. Not just the one. That's the case. Where did it come from that there would only be one alphabet title on the line? Where did it come from that it would just be the IBF? Why would that be the case? When I step back and I look at the whole picture, it's almost like somebody's trying to sabotage Yanni Beck. You're thinking to yourself, here comes Jules with another conspiracy theory. But I came across this comment from Yanni Beck Alam Kanalai that reads, Many boxers, promoters, managers, think that they can take the belts from me. Guys, you are wrong. I have just started my work. I will knock everyone out and collect all four titles. Inshallah, I know all your tricks. Mark my words. I will be in boxing history like Muhammad Ali. Promoters? Managers? Taking his belts? Tricks? Trickery? Hmm. So Top Rank loses the purse bid by a marginal amount of just a thousand dollars. Now he's got to go to Australia. Trickery. They're saying that it's not going to be for both alphabet titles. It's going to be for just the one. Just the IBF. And if it's just for the IBF, this guy's subject to a 10 pound rehydration cap. And this guy just collapsed due to dehydration. These just coincidences. I don't know. It just all looks a certain way, sounds a certain way. And then you think of the state of the middleweight division that Yanni Beck's not a moneymaker and neither are the other two champions at this weight. You know they're going to give you a hard time to unify. You know they are. You try to get Yanni Beck these fights and they're going to ask you for an arm and a leg. They themselves aren't going to make a play to get him in the ring. They're not going to make a play to bring Yanni Beck over to their side. They're going to want you to break the bank to bring them to yours. They're going to give you a hard time. To top rank. All of this may seem like more trouble than it's worth. Yanni Beck may seem like he is more trouble than he's worth. They might want to pull out a middleweight. He's not exactly up Shit's Creek without a paddle, because I think he can beat Andre Mikhailovic, even under these circumstances. So long as he has a decent cut, decent weight cut, he can beat that guy. And if he does, that cancels all of this out. Keeps his belt, keeps his two belts, stays middleweight champion, continues to pursue undisputed at the weight. But maybe he's more interested in that than top rank is, because what's that gonna cost them? trying to make those fights more trouble than it's worth maybe more money than it's worth something's going on there there's more to it than meets the eye that's the impression that i'm getting